All right, I am uh, I'm here with Randy Walbert. Uh, Randy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Um, you're a really interesting guy because what you're doing is you're taking a, a form of therapy and really leaning into the, the Zen aspect of it, the mindfulness aspect of it. Um, and you're taking specifically DBT, which is dialectical behavioral therapy. Can you first, just to lay the groundwork of this discussion, um, tell people what that is? Sure. Um, dialectical behavior therapy was a treatment uh, developed by Marshall Linehan. And Marshall Linehan was very interested in treating persons who were suicidal uh, and emotionally dysregulated. And the traditional types of behavior therapy or non-behavioral types of therapy just were not effective with this group. And so the dialectical in this sense that it includes both behavior therapy and a whole technology of acceptance. And uh, it was actually Marshall Linehan who got uh, the acceptance technology from her study of Zen. And so she took the, uh, her study of Zen and incorporated it into her treatment and it held together with dialectics, which dialectics just simply means the both and instead of either or type of approach. Um, when you say both and instead of either or, what does that necessarily mean? You're taking opposites of uh, your personality or sort of dualities and trying to integrate them? Yeah, it's not it's it's not actually uh, dualities of your personality or opposites of your personality. It is uh, taking the technology of behavior therapy, which is all about change and problem solving. And uh, if you just try to convince people that uh, their lives would be so much better if they just did things different than they did, um, right. they already know that. Uh, what they have trouble is figuring out how to do that. And so uh, the other side of the coin is acceptance, which means that everything is as it should be. Uh, that given the set of circumstances uh, that have happened so far, it makes perfect sense that you'd be in the spot you're at. Uh, so if you just focused on change, then people would say, basically, forget it. I'm not doing this treatment. Uh, I've already tried this stuff. And if you just focused on acceptance where people might feel really good about their therapist and really comfortable, uh, want to come back regularly, you wouldn't actually get better. Right. And so the dialectical piece is taking what seems to be really opposites, change and acceptance, and figuring out how to actually make them work together. I see. Um, and for people who are listening, um, DBT is, is, was considered like revolutionary. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's had strong clinical backing and it's much easier for that reason to get uh, it covered by your insurance. Um, and on the other part of it, <clears throat> on the Zen aspect, um, of what you're doing, uh, for people who know at, at all what Zen is supposed to be, um, the idea of me asking a Zen teacher what Zen is, I mean, it's almost like a classic misunderstanding of, of Zen. Um, is there any way you can um, sort of get around what Zen is about? Sure. Uh, so just, just to be really clear, it's, it's not like I did anything different as far as the, the treatment of uh, DDT is. Uh, right. I've been a DBT uh, practitioner and uh, the last five years as a uh, consultant and trainer in DBT. Um, so I, I'm not doing anything, taking a revolutionary new approach or anything like that. It's just I became very, very interested in the mindfulness aspect of DBT when I first started studying it 25 years ago and had tried several different approaches around mindfulness and uh, settled into Zen about 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, and so what Zen is that uh, 
it's it's not necessarily different than other types of mindfulness, uh, but Zen is a practice that goes way back to uh, China um, around five or six hundred uh, AD uh, when this interesting guy uh, by the name of Bodhidharma uh, left uh, either India or Iran. No one's quite sure certain. Uh, crossed into China because he got really tired of the Buddhists in uh, both of those countries, uh, trying to essentially say that uh, it's all about the scriptures and the Buddha said this and everybody would argue, so no, the Buddha didn't say that, he said this. And he said, it's, it's not about any of those things. It is actually the practice of mindfulness, the practice of meditation, the pointing directly to your mind. And so uh, out of what he did in China, which kind of got mixed with a, a lot of uh, Tao, is uh, a practice known as Chan in Chinese, which just means meditation. And then when it uh, emigrated to uh, Japan, it uh, was named Zen because Zen also means meditation. And so the practice itself is uh, the practice of meditation. And so it gets done. If you were a practicer of Zen, you practice Zen every day. It's called Zazen, which is just sitting meditation. And uh, then there are several different types of varieties of Zen. So mostly um, the group that I belong to is uh, called Sambo Coyotin, which was that they took Zen and said, this is suitable for everyday use. And uh, so <laughs> anybody can actually practice Zen. You don't have to shave your head down the road to the <laughs> monastery. You can actually just practice Zen wherever it is that you're at. And um, so the practice includes the sitting meditation and then koan study. What was that uh, second thing? Koan study. Uh, koans are just riddles. Uh, and basically, they are designed to deepen your understanding of uh, reality as it is. So the idea of enlightenment, uh, also known as Kensho or Satori, is simply that uh, you get in touch with reality as it is. So you have this experience where you uh, everything else drops away and and you see reality. Um, that the Cohens have always been something that I just I'm I'm really attracted to Zen, but I just don't understand the Cohens. Like the um, the classic, what is the the sound of one hand clapping? Yeah. What, what is how, how does how do you even approach that? Um, well, so well, first, uh, if you actually want to do Zen and don't want to do the koans, there is uh, another group of Zen called Soto Zen, which is just all about the city. Oh, so they just uh, they gave up on the koans? <laughs> um, I don't know if they gave up on them or uh, that. Uh, so Zen is that awakening happens very gradually. And okay. Rinzai Zen, which Sambo Kyoden comes from, uh, is much more that uh, awakening happens all at once. And then you have to further study and deepen your understanding. Okay. So yeah. the, the koans themselves, um, it's if you try to approach it with uh, using logic, mm you're pretty much screwed. You'll never figure it out that way. Right. Um, so it is just like the idea of seeing reality as it is, or what we call Buddha nature, is that uh, it's something to be experienced rather than something to be thought about or something to be felt. Mm -hmm. that's, um, that, that's an interesting concept of, because we're always trying to label and classify things with our minds. Um, and you, that's something that I imagine I, I can see how that would work well in a, a therapeutic setting, because oftentimes we're trying to, you know, if someone's like a drug addict, they might look at themselves and be like, oh, I'm a terrible person and apply that label. Mm -hmm. um, in that sense, how can Zen 
um, and mindfulness in particular um, help people who are struggling with, as you said, uh, mental illnesses that were not able to uh, be treated by other forms of therapy? Um, well, just to be really clear, uh, Zen in and of itself would not be considered an adequate treatment for anything. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Zen actually, uh, and all the other types of mindfulness practice, uh, a lot of, um, there are a lot of mindfulness-based treatments out there these mm -hmm. days. And uh, they tend to take more of the Vipassana type of meditation approach, um, which is similar to Zen, but enough different. Uh, but Zen, the way that it can end up helping is that uh, you can actually live your life in the present instead of in the past, uh, because people that live their lives in the past that tend to ruminate a lot, um, will end up getting depressed because they start thinking things should be different than they are. And uh, people who spend their lives thinking about the future all the time uh, tend to get really anxious. Like, oh my God, what am I going to do about this? And so Zen is really good at helping people stay focused on the right here, right now, that this is the only time that's actually real. Um, the other thing that Zen really uh, has brought to the table, so to speak, is the idea of radical acceptance. Mm -hmm. And radical acceptance is a pretty hot concept in psychotherapy these days. There's a lot of people doing a lot of writing about it. Uh, but it is a practice that comes straight from Zen. And uh, the idea here is that you're actually letting go of attachments. Um, so oftentimes we get stuck with, we think things should be different than they are. And we really hang on to that and hang on to it so tightly that we're actually quite miserable. And Zen actually helps people let go of that attachment. So instead of uh, things should be different than they are, it is the actual acknowledgement that everything is as it is. Mm -hmm. And now I can now figure out what changes I can make. But if you get stuck with, I have to have this be this way. Right. That, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. And, you know, and, and then the other thing, of course, is, uh, you know, Zen does uh, a lot of talking. Uh, and again, this comes from Buddhism, but it's, it's very comparable with other spiritual practices that uh, part of the difficulty is uh, our hanging on to things like greed, uh, hatred, and ignorance. Um, in fact, this is like the second great vow. We, we do these great vows for all. And so it's that uh, these things exist. And uh, what we're doing is we're practicing the idea of letting go of these things. It's interesting that a couple of things that came into my mind while you were, you were saying that the first, the concentration on the present is uh, so important, something that, I mean, I struggle with. I think probably everybody does on some level, but, you know, I, I remember hearing some uh, Zen teacher saying something like, uh, like the past is gone and the future doesn't exist. So yeah. it's like really all you have is the present. Um, when it comes to with with DBT, this radical acceptance, but also the change aspect. So, you, in other words, you sort of put aside by acceptance all the baggage that you're carrying. How, how does one change oneself through DBT? All right. Well, I'll give you a really simple example. That's a big uh, question. Yeah. Yeah. Have you have you ever lost your car keys? Sure. Have you ever looked in the same place that you uh, just looked and and say to yourself, they have to be here? Oh, they're oh, always yeah, here. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Will you ever find your car keys in the place that you've just looked and they're not there? No. Will they magically appear? No. All right. 
So this is a failure of radical acceptance. Mm. Once we actually accept that our car keys are, in fact, not in the pocket uh, that we they're always in or hanging on the ring or wherever, uh, once we accept that, then we can start making changes. We can start looking in other places. But unless we don't, unless we uh, accept that as this is this is the reality, it's not there, then we're never going to make the changes. So as long as we hang on to things should be different than they are, that shouldn't have happened, why did this uh, this occur this way, then we'll never be able to move on and, and make changes because we're just thinking, well, it shouldn't have happened. Why did it happen this way? And yeah, so yeah. instead, you can actually then <laughs> accept that this is what is and then be able to move along. Um, the idea of freedom is uh, the, the thing that uh, this gives you is this great sense of freedom. And the freedom is all about not having to have certain things. You can still want it, but you don't have to have it. Interesting. The, going back to what you said earlier about letting go um, of things like greed um, and resentment, and bitterness um that's i mean it's something that like my mom says is like you know there's not enough space on the shelf for that yeah. um is, is that something do you ever uh look at the people who come into your practice and have any reflection on the state of our society more broadly because we're not uh at least in the u.s we're not a culture that lives in the present we're not a society that's training people to, you know, stop thinking about the future and let go of the past and let go of your resentments and, you know, don't, don't be greedy and things like that. Um, it, how much of the, the mental illnesses uh, in people that you encounter do you look at and say, well, this is um, a perfectly natural outcome of the way our society is built? Uh, you know, it's possible that uh, a number of years ago I thought that. Um, however, having an opportunity to have uh, taught DBT in other cultures, yeah. uh, you find out that some of the actual problems that people have are, are fairly universal. And so mm -hmm. it's not really necessarily related to Western culture. Interesting. Um, okay. And, and all that being said, it's, uh, let's take, for instance, like greed. Um, greed is such an interesting thing because at what point is enough enough? Mm -hmm. And uh, we have people that are multimillionaires, billionaires, that actually insist on having more than they already have when they couldn't possibly uh, spend all of what they have right now. And somehow they start equating happiness with having more. And you really see nothing but misery on their part because it's like, I have to have more and more and more. Um, hatred, I, we have, that's our, our stock in trade. It's that uh, it's so much easier to uh, dislike people different than you are if you start blaming them for the problems that you have. Uh, it's like the whole thing around immigrants these days. It's that uh, you start thinking that these people are somehow inferior uh, or that they're coming to steal the things that you have and you hold dear. And so then, of course, you end up hating them. Um, and, and so, Certainly in society, these things are, are prevalent. Uh, and uh, in, in the practice of Zen, it is that we're in fact trying to let go of these. Interesting. The, the, the word mindfulness has become such a buzzword. And yeah. especially in LA, which is where I'm based. Yeah. Um, is there, do you ever... Do you, do you like the fact that mindfulness has grown into such a publicly recognized uh, tool? Do you, do you ever feel like it's misrepresented 
in uh, in popular discourse? Yeah, I, the the problem with mindfulness. I mean, mindfulness really is the hottest, sexiest thing going right now. It's yes. like it's everywhere. It's uh, it's not only in all the psychotherapies. It's in a lot of other types of medicine. Uh, and it's in industry, it's in the military, it's like everybody says, let's do mindfulness. Um, the misrepresentation is that you actually have a goal connected with mindful practice. So the actual goal of mindful practice is just simply mindful practice. The side effects of mindful practice tend to be uh, decreased suffering, greater levels of happiness and well being. Uh, the ability to see reality as it is, uh, better control of your mind. But that's not the per reason why you go practice mindfulness. You practice mindfulness just to practice mindfulness. Right. Um, there's been a lot of the kind of stripping out, so to speak, of all the spiritual components or spiritual aspects of, of mindfulness. Um, and it's just become a, a very sterile type of practice. Um, and, you know, I don't have really strong feelings of those people shouldn't be doing that or why are they doing that? Because um, I think the, the people that end up gravitating toward the practice of mindfulness that uh, find it very useful for themselves will probably continue the practice of mindfulness. And the people that don't, it'll be uh, like a fad like uh, jogging was uh, 25, 30 years ago. Everybody needed to do that. And then that kind of died away. And then there was something else. But I don't know. We might be on to the next big thing after a while. But the people that practice mindfulness uh, because of it's, it's sort of uh, that sense of incompleteness and mindfulness helps with that. Um, they'll continue to practice. Yeah. I remember, uh, seeing at this one corporate event they were doing, uh, people were going, it was like a training event and people were going from, you know, one station to the next. And one of the stations was mindfulness and people were like rushing back and forth. <laughs> and then you'd sit down like, okay, folks, let's be mindful. Whew, five minutes of this and then we're off to the next thing. And it's like, this is so not at all yeah. what it's supposed to be. Um, on, on that note, um, how did you decide that this is what you wanted to do with your life and to dedicate your life to DBT, to Zen, to helping other people out? All right, well, let's... Uh... Let's actually start then pre-DBT. Um, okay. I've been involved in delivery of mental health services uh, since the late 70s, so quite a, quite a number of years. Uh, and so the thing is that uh, most of the individuals that uh, I was able to provide treatment for, uh, I worked in a program called Assertive Community Treatment. And most of the individuals we provided treatment for got a lot better. Uh, individuals that had difficulties with regulating their emotions, particularly individuals with borderline personality disorder, were not getting better. And so I was looking around for other types of treatment, uh, examined a lot of different possibilities, uh, discovered uh, DBT just shortly after Marsha Linehan had published her text. Uh, cognitive Behavior Therapy for Borderline Personality Disorder. Uh, was fortunate enough to be able to go to one of her intensive trainings. And uh, she talked about sort of this mindfulness stuff and Zen stuff. And I really thought it was a lot of crap. Um, really? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I said, Why yeah. Why did you think that? Well, I said, yeah, give me the behavior therapy because that's something that I can I can work with. Um, I don't necessarily uh, buy into this other stuff. Right. And uh, then after doing DBT for a while, it was uh, a very actually a very short while. I started looking into mindfulness, and uh, the my first uh, foray into it was with uh, John Kabat-Zinn's work. Uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction. Uh, he had written a book called uh, Full Catastrophe Living. 
And so I read that and I was practicing uh, mindfulness uh, much more in the John Kabat-Zinn Vipassana way. And uh, I would get going for a while and then I'd drop off and then I'd get going again and I would drop off. And uh, then finally, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, I went to a Zen uh, retreat uh, with Father Pat Hawk, who is a combination Zen master Catholic priest, uh, along with Marshall Lenahan. And uh, within the first day, it was like, oh, I found what I'm looking for. Um, so I, I just then have resonated with the practice of Zen. Uh, I had no intention of ever doing anything other than my own practice. Uh, and then, I don't know, about five or six years ago, um, you know, even longer than that, Marsha got me started, Marsha Linehan got me started on koan study. Uh, and I found that I really liked it a lot and uh, found that I really liked actually taking on Zen students and teaching them Zen. And so, I've been a teacher since uh, 2060. And, um, you know, I, I both continue my study and then I also lead sessions and have students. Okay, so you, you still, uh, it, is your role as a Zen teacher, is that separate from your role in your, uh, in your clinical work? <laughs> Yeah, my, my clinical work is I don't actually have a uh, clinical practice right now. For the last five years, I've been uh, a consultant trainer of dialectical behavior therapy through uh, Behavioral Tech. And Behavioral Tech is a company located in Seattle. It was developed by Marshall Linehan to be able to teach other people how to do dialectical behavior therapy. And so... A majority of my job right now is traveling around uh, the country and actually several foreign countries as well and teaching people how to do dialectical behavior therapy. And I consider that my vocation and my advocation is as a Zen teacher. Um, and as I get closer and closer to retirement, um, I'm hoping to shift the balance more toward a lot more Zen and uh, less teaching of dbt that's interesting I, I what really struck me uh when you were talking about your your entrance into dbt was the fact that uh when you heard about the mindfulness aspect you were uh you were very skeptical and that i think that's a, a good thing because the the idea of you know if if i didn't realize that this has been clinically studied and uh you know you can get it through your insurance and all that good stuff and someone sat me down and said you know oh we're gonna start learning about buddhism and i feel like what am, what am i paying you for <laughs> like, that's right you know um the uh, the cohen thing uh I, I know i already asked about this but um uh this is kind of just a an offbeat question do you feel like this is an appropriate response to the the one hand clapping thing? Um, Hunter, well, let, sorry, let, let me back up a minute. the The actual koan yes. is not what is the sound of one hand clapping. Yes, um, it is. This is the sound of two hands clapping. What is the sound of one hand? Oh, I see. So that. Uh, that I, I don't quite realize what the difference would be, although it seems like that would uh, that would create a different mental experience if you dwelled on that for a long time. I, I just thought it was funny when Hunter Thompson, the writer, was asked that question and he reached across the table and slapped the guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you, Zen is, a lot of it's about, um, as you mentioned, not being tied to any particular text or church. Um, which I, I really like about that. Do you ever feel uh, as a teacher of Zen um, where just by virtue of being a teacher, you're in a position of authority? Um, how do you, how do you got, how do you navigate that experience where people look at you and 
you might be like, oh, well, this guy can teach us the way. I mean, how, how do you teach Zen in a Zen way, I guess? Well, if, if you uh, find any teacher that says that there, you can give you an enlightened an experience or, or uh, point or, you know, lead, lead you to the path of enlightenment, you got to run away as fast as you can. That right, person's right. running back. Um, so the, the purpose of uh, getting a Zen teacher is that, uh, again, the practice itself is the, the city meditation. And so then a lot of times while sitting uh, or walking or just experiencing daily life, you will end up with uh, these experiences. And what you do is you go to your Zen teacher and you tell your Zen teacher about your experiences. And your Zen teacher will confirm that, uh, yes, this sounds really consistent with uh, reality as it is, or uh, as we refer to it as Buddha nature. Uh, or they'll say, no, it's just one of those things that happen. Um, so you, you never end up uh, trying to think that you are some type of guru that you're trying to bring this person on this path. It is, in fact, that uh, you're kind of their companion along the path. And it's like, let's, let's walk along. Let's see what we're doing here. Um, with, with Zen Koan study, um, I mean, these koans are old. Um, a lot of them date back to around 750, 800 AD. Um, and then they go beyond that. But um, so they do have answers, um, which surprises a lot of people because they look at it and there's no way there can be an answer to this. But they, they do actually have answers. And it is, in fact, the... Uh, Zen teacher's responsibility to uh, check whether the student actually understands Buddha nature on the basis of that koan or not. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, one of the things that I've always been kind of puzzled about, sometimes Zen is described as like a feeling of oneness with the universe. That yeah. sounds, that sounds uh, hippy-dippy. But I, I imagine there's more to it than that. It, what is that? Mean? Actually, not exactly. much more than that. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I guess you could say that uh, the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, was the first original hippie then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was his experience. Uh, certainly, the... the uh, of uh, the experience of Zen is that uh, there are in fact no others. That uh, the boundaries that we put up, uh, the dualities that we think exist are, are just basically delusions. Um, they don't at all really exist. And to be able to experience that sense of great unity, that great sense of oneness uh, is what uh, they refer to as Satori or Kensho or an enlightenment experience. Now, it's interesting. It's like every spiritual mystical practice uh, has something similar to that. Um, in Jewish traditions, it's called Kabbalah, which, again, is sort of that uh, being one with the divine, being one with Yahweh. Um, in Christian mysticism, it is uh, being one with the Trinity. Um, and even the whole Trinity then starts making sense. Um, so in Sufism, uh, the great uh, Sufi poet Rumi talks about uh, that there are, in fact, no others. Somebody asked him, how should I treat others? And he said, there are no others. Uh, so it is that great sense of oneness, of unity. Uh, and unfortunately, you can't think your way into that. It is just something that you have to be, experience. That's, but, uh, 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 sorry, go ahead. Even, even like uh, astrophysicists now, um, actually anybody, any physicist actually understands that thing of the non-duality of the universe. Um, 
So uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, for instance, he talks about uh, when I look up at the night sky, he said most people look up and they feel really small because they're small and the universe is so, so big. He said, but I feel big because I am made up of the same atoms as those stars. Right. There really is no difference between me and the stars. Yeah, that's, um, it's interesting to point that out because, I mean, the, the whole idea of the Big Bang is that at one point, all of the matter in the universe was shrunk down to a single point. It's like, what better argument for the fact that we're literally all one? Yeah. Um, the, uh, this, this idea of the collapse of the ego and sort of uh, uh, collapse of the self, I guess, maybe recognizing that there are no others, there's no distinction between self and others, um, it, it sounds very psychedelic. Um, how how tuned in <laughs> how how tuned in are you to the um, to the developments at places like Maps, which is like the um, uh, it's uh, an association for like psychedelic studies, and they're getting uh, some uh, government uh, funding and uh, to do things like you know uh, see if MDMA can help victims of trauma and uh, psilocybin can help people uh, with you know uh, fear of their own mortality uh, do you see these as as positive developments or you know things that maybe down the line could be integrated with uh, therapy well I, th I think the thing is that uh, the the problem uh, that we've had for a long time is that we've taken this real moral stance about certain types of psychoactive uh, chemicals. Uh, so we say that things like LSD or psilocybin or even cannabis is bad. And at the same time, we go out and we create all these uh, SSRIs and um, other psychoactive drugs that we legally market <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's, I am a very strong, uh, proponent of doing research and actually doing some really good, uh, RCTs, random controlled trials and, uh, seeing whether in fact they are useful or not useful. Um, there certainly is some belief out there that actually certain of the um, hallucinogenic uh, drugs that are available would be almost shortcutting the process of uh, sitting for years and years of finding enlightenment. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not opposed to anything, uh, but at the same time, I'm not going to go out and advocate for it until I actually can see that there is some very strong, solid evidence behind it. Right. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's probably an important distinction. Do you, do you feel at all when people, because um, my, my friend uh, talked to his parents about, uh, you know, saying, well, I've, I've actually, I've done psychedelics, and I think this has been good for my development. And their response was something like, uh, um, you know, these are revelations that um, you probably would have come to regardless over time. Do you, do you feel like that is a cheat or like a, a cheat code? Yeah, I, I, I have no idea. And, okay. uh, and really, at, at the end of the day, I'm not certain it makes any difference. Interesting. Um, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. So the, the last thing I wanted to ask you is, what would you uh, say to people right now who are uh, looking for help? You know, maybe they're interested in the kinds of uh, uh, things you're doing, uh, DBT, Zen. Um, they're not. Maybe they're uh, going to commit to therapy, maybe not. Um, w what can they start doing in their lives right now? Well, um, you know, if they actually would benefit from DBT, I would say go find a good DBT therapist. And uh, there are a lot of good questions that you can ask a uh, uh, 
potential therapist uh, as to what is it that they believe. Uh, if they actually start talking in terms of being able to teach skills and uh, helping you, in fact, and get the life that you want and have a real interest in what is it that you actually want from therapy, they're probably a decent therapist. Um, if you want to pursue Zen, uh, there are any number of uh, Zen places, and especially you being out in California, it seems like you can't throw a stone without hitting a Zen temple. <laughs> uh, so the, the thing that you'd want to do is uh, go do a little shopping and uh, go to, because uh, every Zen place has uh what they call uh, open zazen or practice, and uh, go to uh, several of them and just see how you end up feeling in the uh, uh, while you're there. Does this something that resonates with you or not? Um, a book that I would recommend uh, is called Taking the Path of Zen. It's by Robert Aitken, A-I-T-K-E-N. Um, he was a Japanese prisoner of war. Um, during World War II, and uh, his guards actually taught him Zen, and uh, he took it back with him to the West uh, and uh, started a uh, Zen lineage called Diamond Sangha, and it's, it's pretty much everywhere these days. Uh, but he wrote this book called Taking the Path of Zen, and in there he really specifically talks about if you're looking for a teacher, here's the things to look for. Mm. Uh, the Sangha that uh, I am with, um, there's actually two of them. There's one in North America, and it's just called the Empty Cloud Sangha. And uh, then there's one in Latin America, which is called Empty Cloud Sangha Latin America. Uh, and we uh, started out as, I mean, it was actually started by Marshall Linehan, and, and I'm taken over since then. Uh, but we specialize in uh, helping people who are mental health professionals, other healthcare providers. Uh, but it's really open to anybody who's interested in pursuing any of uh, the practice of Zen. Um, well, on that note, uh, before we wrap up, is there anything uh, you wanted to say or anything you want to promote or anything like that? Or No? <laughs> okay. A simple man. Uh, yeah, Randy, that's good, Randy. I mean, uh, if, well, really, if people want to find out more about uh, DBT, yeah, I think the uh, the best source is uh, behavioraltech.org. Okay, which is uh, the website of uh, the company in Seattle um, that does a lot of training in behavioral tech. That they have resources for both. Uh, clients, families, and practitioners. And uh, if they want to find more out about uh, the, the Zen um, that I've been involved with, uh, we're at emptycloudsangha.org. And that is uh, Sangha, S-A-N-G-H-A? -A? Yes. All right. Uh, Randy, thank you very much for your time. Absolutely.